Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Coin Geek Weekly live stream. I am your host, Kurt Walker Jr. With the blurry background, I keep trying to turn it off, and it, it comes back on by default. It doesn't like something in my background, I guess. So, thank you, Streamyard, or whatever application makes this decision. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to say welcome to everybody, and welcome to Alex Moon. Uh, he and I have been running circles around a whole bunch of stuff, uh, preparing for. Gosh, what feels like everything, the the global blockchain convention, uh, all kinds of little coin geek events, coin geek initiatives, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I guess we'll sleep when we're dead. <laughs> so uh, for anybody who is, uh, you know, wants to point out, Kurt, you look a little tired. Let me tell you, I am indeed a little bit tired. And for that, I not only can thank my work, but also my delightful family who's off at swimming lessons at the, at the moment. So hi, kids. Hope all's well. <laughs> Uh, daddy misses you. And I'm looking forward to the next time we get to hang out in the pool together, kids and, and wife. <laughs> so, uh, everybody, uh, we're going to have a, I, I, we're at a different time today. Uh, we had some, some scheduling rigmarole in the background of a bunch of stuff. Uh, frankly, it was, it was largely on our end and then, uh, like 90 other people trying to coordinate. And we decided to, uh, take a couple of steps back, retool slightly. And we're doing the show at noon with, the delightful Richard Baker, who I'm very excited to uh, to have a nice conversation with. Frankly, uh, there's been uh, oh, oh here's the here's the word of the day, the Coin Geek word of the day. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate your uh, your prodding. <laughs> so, if you want to go earn twenty five dollars over at Slictionary, sponsored by Coin Geek, you can define the word tokens, perhaps forever. You can be the person that defines the word and earns payouts from it for all eternity, if it is that good of a definition. Um, so anyways, I, I wanted to say uh, the, the exciting thing about talking with Richard is that um, there's been a lot of confusion for years, frankly, about big block Bitcoin and uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, why would we mine bigger blocks? Aren't bigger blocks bad because X, Y, and Z? And, and frankly, this was a discussion I've been part of since 2015. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just finally getting to the point where we're really testing out uh, what some of our theories are mean. So uh, I'm very excited about all of that. But before we get to Richard, we're going to have to play an ad from our delightful sponsors at the Global Blockchain Initiative. They were so kind to reach out and sponsor the show here. And then um, we'll come back with Richard and talk about the real economics of, of Bitcoin, the way it was always designed, the way that Satoshi Nakamoto envisioned it, and the way that he explained it literally on week one. This is before the blockchain even started to be mined. He was talking about visa size scale, moving into data centers and all this other stuff that we're really excited to see um, Tal working on and then and also attracting new players into the, the mining ecosystem and the transaction processing ecosystem. So Alex, please play the ad and we'll be right back. This is a line of code. It is nothing at first. But it is the start of something, an idea. With the right community, ideas grow into solutions. Welcome to the BSV Global Blockchain Convention. The hybrid BSV Global Blockchain Convention connects the tech and business communities to form partnerships, engage with brands and leaders you care about, shape the next generation of blockchain applications, explore dynamic brand showcases and innovations, discover the positive impact of blockchain on society, regulation and law, cybersecurity, healthcare, environmental sustainability, smart cities, finance, banking, supply chain. The stage is set. Witness the power of blockchain technology. BSV Global Blockchain Convention, where possibilities are boundless. Man, if the whole world could see our private chat, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be great when that leaks someday. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much for coming. How are you? I'm really well. Great to see you, Kurt. Pleasure to be on the show. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I start out with almost everybody. I gotta ask if you could give us the brief version. What is your Bitcoin story? How did you discover it? What made it appeal to you before you ever understood it? And um, what what made you decide to get into the business of Bitcoin? Uh, 
actually, that goes back to 2015, 16 for me. Uh, I was running my own financial services commodities exchange. And the back end of that exchange, we were using fixed protocol to clear in and out of multiple clearing houses around the world. Um, and fixed protocol, for those that don't know, is the dominant protocol in traditional financial services yeah. for clearing settlement. And uh, yeah, we, we started to look at uh, blockchain as an alternative to fix back in 2016. And uh, we looked at some of the private blockchains, but that, that particular investigation led us to Enchain and the original engineering that was going on um, at Enchain. And we couldn't quite make it work back then. Um, it's a big effort to display something like fix from the financial services markets, but I'm pretty motivated now. Uh, I, I think <laughs> we can see a different future uh, with the way things have matured. So that was my first uh, engagement with Bitcoin. No, oh, that's that's fascinating. It's it's fascinating to to hear. I mean, from the financial services company, and you know, Fitz is like, yeah, it's it's the thing, right? So it's it's interesting. You're you're one of those people that uh, at the time were theorizing. I remember the conversations in Bitcoin circles, like. I wonder if anybody's looking at at blockchain for <laughs> for doing this kind of thing. So uh, you're the proof that it was, it seems. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, th I think in, we'll get to talk about those kind of things in due course. But uh, financial services is certainly trawling over the use of Bitcoin and digital ledger technology generally now. Sure. I think I think obviously R three consortium has been probably the the main player in town, um, but. Uh, there's not a week that doesn't go by, Kurt, now without a conversation with a financial services company that is yeah. exploring a new future. Well, that's that that's incredible. That's that's awesome news. Can, can we talk a little bit about like what um, what sort of preceded Tal? Like, if you go back even just three or four years, there was there was Coin Geek mining, and then sort of got consolidated. I remember the talk of Squire a bit, uh, and then Squire um, was mining, and then you know I, I know there's been a bunch of rearrangements and consolidations, and probably some buys and sells and then ultimately tall can you explain what that looks like because it's it was kind of a lot of like oh the brand's different again <laughs> yeah no I, I think there's probably been three uh incarnations of tal um i i'm not a fay with the the very very beginning but mm -hmm. uh, you, you're correct you know i think going back to 2013 uh there was an aspiration ultimately that the first phase of the business was going to take a deep look at being an asic mining equipment manufacturer. Yeah. And so first money was deployed around investigating, you know, a particular type of CPU. And, and so that was, that was era one. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, you know, you know, you, you know how this works, but unless you're kind of getting the economies of scale and you can get the depth of a Taiwanese manufacturer or a Chinese manufacturer or some of the U S manufacturers now, yeah. uh, you know, you, you need a lot of capital to build that business. Um, and then, yes, yeah, Square became uh, the first mining company. And so, uh, again, that was building mining rigs and beginning to mine. And some of that was also rented capacity. And then, you know, there was uh, a rebirth a couple of years ago. And uh, Tal, which is named after a mountain, volcano, um, really became the next iteration. And I think, you know, I'm delighted. I took over, as you know, Kurt, 1st of January this year to run Tal. I was on the board last year. Um, and yeah, I think we are very clear on what we're trying to do. The business is known as uh, a mining company, but actually I'm taking the company clearly into the world of being a blockchain infrastructure company, a platform business. For sure. Um, and this is linked to the fact that mining is just one small component of what the Bitcoin protocol uh, enables customers to do. And we need to be a very strong service provider in releasing the full power of that protocol. No, absolutely. And I'll, I'll tell you just from me personally, I, I have I have every ability to be critical. Uh, my, my mandate at CoinGeek is to be journalistic. And I, I will tell you right now, I have basically no criticism so far of what I've seen from you, your vision, et cetera. Um, I, I had been critical in the past. Uh, Tal, um, ultimately, I mean, is a trailblazing company. I don't want to take anything away from you know the grand vision of Tal in the first place, but there have been steps along the way that have made me say, "Ooh, you know, I, I, not, not the way I would have handled it." But uh, just to start off our talk here, I just wanted to let you know I'm very much a Richard Baker fan, <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm excited for this new era and and uh, really excited for this conversation, actually. So. 
Well, thank you for saying that, Kurt. No, I, I, I've, I can't believe I've only been in the hot seat for three and a half, four months. There's been a lot achieved in that. Short for sure. Time. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think let's get into the meat of that because I think, yeah, there has been some errors and there has been some challenges. And I think that's a community topic. Not, you know, there's a handful of companies that perhaps could have done things differently. Um, yep. I can't change the past, but I can certainly influence the future. Absolutely. Uh, Alex, if you could bring that question back up, I, I, I would like to uh, cover it. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions from the people in the in the community who want to know. So please, everybody, if you're watching the show, if you could like, subscribe, uh, hit the alarm bell so you know every time we go live. If you could retweet this or send out on social media, uh, we would love to get as many questions live with Richard while we have him for this hour. And so please, uh, anything you want to ask, uh, please feel free to ask. I can't promise he'll answer everything in the universe, but uh, I would be happy to ask them. So the question from Joseph Mallory, do all of the recent Tal asset liquidations mark a transition in Tal's strategy? Uh, it marks uh, an execution of the strategy. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the two that we've communicated recently, and I'm being slightly careful as I chat with you today, Kurt, because we're about to publish our 2021 annual results and sure. some corporate updates. And so I don't want to trip myself into a, a breach of market rules. As, as you know, we're public, sure. publicly listed in Canada. Um, but yeah, I think firstly, uh, we had acquired land and a building in New Brunswick in Canada. This site was known as Grand Falls. And, uh, you know, this is a 50 megawatt, 60,000 square foot property that we'd acquired ultimately to build out as a, a mining data center. And so when I took over the business and we started to look at the, the capital plan and how we actually go about building that, um, we, we kind of quickly moved on actually looking for partners in the market to help us do that. And that search came to a, a really successful conclusion in the fact that we've partnered with a mutual fund, but that is a specialized property fund. And the deal we've transacted there is step one. They've acquired the land and the site from us. Um, but ultimately, we've entered into a long term lease agreement where we are the sole tenant that will occupy that building for the long term. And as part of that transaction, that puts a bit of cash on Tal's balance sheet, which is useful for our other growth initiatives. For sure. But it's also that they will commit CapEx to build out the heavy plant and equipment. And so, uh, yeah, getting into the exciting step now of ordering substations and distribution <laughs> transformers and. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that really is the fun stuff, especially the last year or so. Like, I, I have to, I've I've been in the mining space since 2013 myself, and it's changed tremendously. So you know, looking at even jumping in at myself, like, well, what you know, how much are transformers? And I get a a quote for what I thought is you know five <laughs> times the proper price and like an 18 month lead time at the same time. So <laughs> I'm yeah. sure your procurement people are uh, you know on fire at their keyboards and <laughs> during the day. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And, and this is, you know, with, with post the COVID pandemic, actually supply chains are in quite yeah. disarray. So forward ordering uh, substations and indeed just ordering, you know, the, the line upgrade where we're update, yeah. updating the line from 69 kilovolt amps to 138 to deliver the 50 megawatts. And sure. there's a long lead time on that work. No, but all good, sure. you know, it's, it's, it's good old operational project management activity. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's in good hands. Yeah, and so the second activity I think that people will have picked up on is that we had a managed service agreement with Hut8, mm -hmm. where we had circa 960 machines in operation at Hut8. And um, that we'd actually entered into a, a kind of a rolling year agreement, but uh, part of that is uh, we're bringing that to a close. So we actually decided... Those particular machines had all been upgraded. Uh, people may not know, but across Canada, actually the supply voltage works in different voltage amp terms in different places. So those machines are actually custom built to be in Hut 8 oh, facilities. Oh so <laughs> there was a little point in us ripping them out and putting them into a different hosting center. Yeah. So we decided we would sell them and ultimately acquire new machines in a different facility. So that was the second. So that absolutely, this is this is part of an execution plan. Um, and maybe to that, Kurt, um, you know, so Tal sits with circa 425 petahash of capacity today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're, we're, we're very much targeting growth for the next 24 months. So I want to take the network to be north of two exahash by the end yeah. of 2023. 
Mm -hmm. And I would like that geographically dispersed. I, I, I'm a networks guy. I grew up in optical networking and data centers and cloud computing. And I don't want to have Tal's fleet in one location. It needs yeah. to be geographically no, sure. dispersed. Well, and, and that's got to be very clear to, to people looking at the, the risk associated. I mean, we've had the biggest shakeup in mining since probably 2013 when ASICs first uh, started to be manufactured. But shoot, just a year ago, China was the number one place for hashing on Earth. And now I think it's probably Texas. But we've also seen shakeups in uh, Kazakhstan and Russia and all these other places. So what is what is that landscape like for you guys? How are you, How do you even plan for that with like, the geopolitical nonsense that makes all of this so difficult to plan. Are, are you trying to focus on the Western Hemisphere? Do you have any interesting ideas about the way to make it uh, geographically diverse? Uh, yeah, I, and, and you're right. You know, it's now a complicated kind of uh, matrix of assessment because ultimately you're looking for appropriate land or buildings. Yeah. Um, in all cases, actually, it's not that ideal to buy an old building and refurbish it. There's cost mm -hmm. and time in, in that decision. Um, you, you obviously you know well, but you're really prioritizing sourcing clean energy, and you're looking for you know appropriately priced power. And ideally, you're looking for something that's between five cents per kilowatt and no more than eight and a half. Um, so when you put that mix together, and and now with the geopolitical challenges, so uh, I have publicly addressed that Tal uh, a few years ago entered into a managed service agreement with a data center provider in Siberia in Russia. Mm -hmm. We have a percentage of our mining fleet there, and we had to take some very tough decisions when the Ukraine war broke out. One, I feel a moral responsibility about what we do for the long term, um, but equally I have shareholders and stakeholders I need to manage in the short term. Indeed. Uh, so we, we, re, we pulled uh, quite a lot of our machines from going to that location, and we're redirecting those assets at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so we, we will bring them to North America into new hosting facilities uh, in North America over the next few months. Um, so yeah, when you then put together, Kazakhstan's no longer a market, really Russia's no longer a market, China's no longer a market. Um, there is big debate, I think, Kurt, around the fact that the European Parliament is debating proof of work mining. Indeed, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, it passed, or, or it got through in, in February without a ban, but it was a very, very close vote. And so at the moment, I think that bill is coming back again in September, and we could see proof of work mining banned in Europe this year. And so Europe is high risk to think about running yeah. the mining operation presently. So it's North America and Canada. Yep. And, and again, as you know well, every state in North America has a slightly different uh, <laughs> regulatory policy as well. So Indeed, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm pleased. We're, we're in a good place, actually. Canada is proving really successful for us. And I, I think uh, I can't declare anything now, but we've got some... Sure. interesting uh, agreements coming together in in north america no that then that's brilliant and it really is it's we went from the whole world being a ripe place to to work and now it's like two-thirds of it is basically off the table and this isn't even you know the consideration of like africa and south america which from like a climate and infrastructure standpoint are also not really desirable so it's a very interesting time to be an american uh, bitcoin miner <laughs> yes absolutely but, you know, I think you, you get into this. You can't be faint hearted in this industry, can you? Um, and I think particularly when you're working in our ecosystem, uh, I am a really firm believer in the Bitcoin protocol. You know, a host now, I, I try and make sure I see three to four major enterprises as customers every week. Yeah. And um, the, the conversation with, with enterprises has changed, you know, and I think a lot of enterprises have come through the cycle of, playing around with an IBM Hyperledger or they've given, you know, Cardona a go or so they've played on Solidity with Solano. Yeah. Um, and I, I certainly observe that most big enterprises now realize that a private blockchain is not a solution for the future. Yeah. Early on, their selection criteria was they were worried about data privacy and data sovereignty, and they didn't want to use a public blockchain. But they've realized actually that there is security and privacy in a public blockchain. And the Bitcoin protocol stands out really strong when you mm -hmm. see that kind of assessment criteria. And then it comes to scalability, and I see some of the comments on online around scalability. We'll come to that. But yeah. again, when you're really looking at transactions per second and you're looking at being able to support big you know, financial services companies and large volume, the protocol has the capability to really scale. Absolutely. 
And we just have to be bold enough to pursue it. I, I think, um, now here's, a, here's a, a quick question. How many TPS, transactions per second, can Tal handle? Do we know? Yeah, uh, we do. Um, and it comes back to ultimately how the node is engineered. And it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that we're talking today. But uh, the, the SV node has been tested up to 3,000 transactions per second. So that's mm -hmm. 259 million per day. Uh, that we could be processing. Um, and so, so it's, it's dependent on the node. It's, and obviously we gear up our infrastructure to run a number of nodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as again, something I attended to in Q1, we, we also make sure that as we uh, participate as, an, as a miner and operate in the BSV network, every single transaction that hits the TAL APIs or our broadcast windows, everything goes to the public network. Mm -hmm. No, and that's and that's a, a really first of all a cool change. Uh, I think it's one of the things that I remember when Mappy first came out that there was this discussion of oh this is really great you can do fee quotes on the fly and that kind of thing figure out the best places to to put your stuff on the network but then very quickly became and there's this opportunity for us to consolidate transactions privately and like as a businessman I look at that and say oh that that makes sense like you would work with the transaction processor that you want to work with and they get the fees for your business that makes a lot of sense but it actually it it's debatable how functional that is with bitcoin given the way that the network sort of demands things uh you know because of orphan risk and some other stuff to to be propagated peer to peer as soon as they're found and um it it made it essentially uncompetitive for smaller miners to come in unless they had the ability to like bring in hash like when they had a client deal that they needed to manage and i think there was a lot of um i don't want to say anti-competitive because i don't think it was malicious but i i, I think that it's um that it, it made things a little bit anti-competitive for anybody to decide to come in to the point where we've even seen like via btc and some of these other pools say Eh, we already don't really want to turn our nodes up to even even above eight megabytes, I think is what some of these other <laughs> nodes were mining. And so I'm curious to hear your thought process on why the change in heart. Uh, I think I know why, and I'm glad that it has changed, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what your process was there. Uh, well, I guess my process links to, I spent a large part of my early career in sales, Kurt. Mm. Um, and I really believe in listening to our clients and listening to the market. Um, and again, I will get myself into trouble here, but I think uh, there's no room for, and this will sound strange considering the, the ecosystem we're in, but I, I just have no patience and time for arrogance. And we are a community and I really believe in the power of this community, but part of that means that you have to face the things that aren't working. And uh, I think the harsh reality is um, the nodes were not engineered uh, correctly. Mm. And we particularly focus here on the fact that we had the dust limit and the relay fee in the SV node, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't have been there. And um, that has, you know, the relay fee created the dust fee challenges, and it's created a lot of implementation difficulties for customers and application builders. And so in my first kind of 30 to 60 days in taking over, I, I just spent time talking to uh, the builders really in the ecosystem. So the, mm -hmm. the developers and the, the guys that are trying to get things done and girls that are trying to get things done. <laughs> um, and it really became abundantly clear to me. And uh, I took the difficult challenge to sit down with the N-Chain node team <laughs> And we dragged Craig right into that discussion. Oof. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was a, a scary few days, but ultimately sure. uh, we kind of made the right decisions. And that was that the node needed to be rebuilt now, mm -hmm. remove the relay fee, remove the dust fee, and ultimately deploy a configuration that is on boot up, uh, is for every miner to select the transaction fee. And so, you know, that's what's being announced or that has what, what's, what's coming from the Bitcoin Association this week. And I'm really delighted that we've taken that step. And why is that important? Well, it's, it's a fundamental part of the way the protocol is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that one's under our belt. And I would like to thank my own engineering team because they flagged the issue to me. They were the ones frontline dealing with a lot of the issues from clients that use the network day in, day out. For um, sure. 
So yeah, uh, so it, in, in my own, the assessment was talk to the clients, figure out what's working and not working and make sure you address it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's really you know my, my commendation at the beginning of the call. That's really where it comes from is I, I've yet to meet, uh, yeah, I've met a couple others, but executives in the Bitcoin space that are, they look at the problems of the market and say, oh, actually I do have the power to fix this. And so it's, it's refreshing and I'm grateful for your leadership on that. Gonna, yeah, I have a question from, sorry, go ahead. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I, I see some of the questions coming in as well and they yeah. link, so, but I, please steer it, Kurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, James DeRose here. Uh, what's, what has surprised you about working with Bitcoin since your involvement at Tal began? Um, well, I think personally for me, I, I love technology. So I would say um, when you sit down and sketch out on a whiteboard the native capability of the Bitcoin protocol, and then you look at it through the lens of you know, payment channels through SPV, and when you really look at it as a digital cash system, um, the power of that protocol and that system is just mind-blowingly big. And Absolutely. so I get super excited about what all of that really represents. And then the harsh reality is I think we've really, as an ecosystem, only implemented 40% of its capability. <laughs> yeah, if that. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I think, I think this is, this is the challenge to us all this year, which is we kind of really have to lift the lid on how multi-sig wallets will work with payment channels. We're working to hash table lookups, indexing back into the way we expect the node of the future to run. And I re refer there to, you know, SV node is here today, but we certainly will expect uh, a journey board that takes us to a Terranode program going into 2023. Yeah. And, you know, Terranode is quite an exciting architecture. It'll be a microservices based implementation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we will start to see the Bitcoin protocol really unlock it from a networking point of view when we reach, when we reach that. So yeah. my, my that, that's on my mind all the time. And, and strategically, we need to steer that architecture to make sure we really get the power of the protocol in the market. No, for sure. I think it's an interesting step, given given how much more efficient Terranode should be, uh, at least in theory, like there's not a spec out for people to, to drill into yet. But conceptually, like we've seen the 50 to 100,000 transactions per second sort of stuff. And we've seen some graphs as to how it will work from like a cloud distribution standpoint and and you know we get it at a high level but i'm curious let's say in two years the the price of bsv is two thousand dollars a coin and the average block size is you know a hundred gigabytes or something like that how do we how do we then get folks from you know say foundry or or uh, ant pool or, or f2 pool or some of these places to to come look at us. Now, I understand that the profitability will be part of that uh, carrot on the stick, but at the end of the day, it seems like they're going to have to essentially come to you or or just a handful of other people to say, uh, hey, how do we even set this stuff up? This is so far out of our assumptions about Bitcoin. Is there a roadmap on that and maybe an educational standpoint uh, specifically to reach out to other infrastructure players to say, hey, we would love to have your hash power and, and have you as a competitor and a, and a, and a you know, an industry colleague, as it were. But but that's a lot of big steps, uh, both from a business development standpoint and an engineering standpoint. So is it something you see Tal taking on or, or would you suggest maybe it's Bitcoin Association? Like whose initiative should that be? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think um, I, I've talked to Patrick uh, and Marcin at the Bitcoin Association a lot about this over the last few months. Yeah. And I think it has to be a bit of a team effort at this point in time. Sure. So, you know, I, I think they do a phenomenal job of providing education and access. And I, I know that that's uh, only going to improve this year on. Mm -hmm. I, I've certainly taken a lead in the fact that I have spoken with a lot of the BTC miners Um and I have been talking to them about the virtues of running the BSV node and, and what we do. And, and I do this, Kurt, because ultimately we need to see strong competition in the mining layer. You know, if that consensus network is to be trusted for the very, very long term by big enterprises, you know, we need 
a minimum of three miners committed to that network long term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what I have detected in talking to some of the really big BTC miners is there is still, I would say, a very large misunderstanding, believe it or not, around mm -hmm. yield rates and what they're mining for. Yeah. And so we, we, we've run some analysis and again, maybe some of the audience doesn't fully know, but not all of Tal's fleet of hashing power is on BSV. We economically switch uh, today between BCH and uh, BSV, and we do that partly linked to a treasury strategy. And that treasury strategy is really simple. B BCH and BTC, we would mine ultimately to sell and create working capital and, and drive our investments. BSV, we want to mine and ideally hold it because I do see a future where those Satoshis become incredibly important to how we unlock a service strategy and how those Satoshis are used uh, as part of the, 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 the kind of steps towards UTXO services and payment channels. Um, so chatting with the miners, actually, we put some analysis together. And if you look at the way BCH, BTC and BSV yields at the moment, you can normalize it at roughly 20,000 US dollars per 100 petahash today. Interesting. And, and it's very marginal which, which one of those coins you're mining. Mm -hmm. And that is the way the difficulty rate is working on BTC versus BCH versus BSV. And again, yeah. as you know yourself, the BSV difficulty rate updates more dynamically uh, yes. based on the last block. So, uh, yeah, and the minute you go through this with investors and you go through this with other mining companies, the lights go on and go, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the coin price. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's interesting. I, I was at the Bitcoin 2022 event and, you know, the, the moon boys were, you know, all one thing, but I, I found a lot of kinship with the people in the mining. Uh, there was like a trade show essentially where other hashers and different mining services companies and, you know, just talking to them, it was, it was very interesting to hear when you explain just the, the basic economics, like what does your business look like in 10 years when the block reward on Bitcoin is X and you could be mining big block Bitcoin at a hundred gigabyte average block size and, you know, and showing some of the world record blocks. It's, it's great that we actually have real world data now, as opposed to theories of Bitcoin. And it was interesting to see a lot of their faces and be like, Oh, Oh, interesting. So if you mine, if you mine a block that has 10 coins worth of fees, it's like the price is a uh, 150% higher than the, than yeah. the price would assume it is. And, you know, so you see them like, having their like minor uh-oh moments about their own business models. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, I talk to a lot of uh, investors uh, at the moment and it is, uh, you know, it's quite amazing. There's about $5.4 billion worth of mining equipment coming into the industry this year on BTC. Yeah. Uh, massive expansion. And of course, that's all ahead of the, the, the kind of the next halving event. Um, but Actually, you know, traditionally, a lot of mining companies raise equipment finance to, to, to keep refreshing and expanding the fleets. And a lot of lenders presently are really worried about that halving event mm -hmm. and, and what's going to happen to BTC and what will the yields be like. And so there, there is uncertainty. And of course, that uncertainty can be mitigated by unpicking and telling the story of what transaction processing and service fees are all about. Yeah. And this is this is the utility story that only BSV can tell. For sure. Alex, bring that question back up. Does it not fit? Uh, I know Greg. <laughs> Greg is a uh, is a local here. He's a Miami guy, but he's got uh, some interesting stuff that I've seen a couple of times. I'll, I'll read that. It's a long one. So bear with me, world. A technology for the future node that could handle interrupts in one clock cycle, dynamically optimize without a power cycle, auto change the processor power requirement requirement dynamically in under a second to save energy scale to wafer scale like cerebras and tesla dojo for supercomputer bandwidth and add location hopping cyber attack security is real today via touring micro this is greg's company touring micro check it out uh is there a use for this with tal or do you just want your platform using today's tech we can't seem to get progress it seems there's more to this question but um it's not cut off. So Greg, Greg has pitched this to me. I, I've seen this. I saw it once in um, London in 2020. And then I recently saw him again at the New York conference uh, just this last October. And he has a, a really interesting um, proprietary. It's his, his deal 
a ton of technology in, in CPU and, and just computer management. Um, frankly, some of it's over my head and I'm not uh, real up on, on it, but I'm curious what the, the research and development looks like at Tal on, on this sort of stuff like that. Um, you know, the, the, Hey, this could change the world if only someone would buy or invest or whatever. Is there a certain amount of the budget that goes into the like swinging for the fences sort of crazy thing that could be the future in five years or, or how conservative is that uh, at Tal? Uh, we don't have a big research team focused on that kind of activity, Kurt. So firstly, to Greg, uh, happy to meet and talk offline. Interested in that, would like to understand it. Uh, I, I actually live in Cambridge in the UK, and that's home to ARM, and I have a, a bit of a, a path with some of the quantum uh, teams that have spun out of ARM and are, are looking at silicon in different ways. And even the ARM team themselves have just released the first wafer technology that isn't silicon. Mm. Um, so uh, can, we, can we pick that one up separately? Um, we, we look to the future, absolutely. But I think, again, you hear a, a lot of sort of language from me, which is Enchain is the research company. And they've got, you know, a, a lot of staff and some incredibly talented people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, today, Tal licensed the intellectual property from Enchain a few years ago, and we have laid down a handful of patents of our own mm -hmm. in the areas of IoT and, and uh, the way we envisage the network working through the lens of kind of a blockchain infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I presently will not spend a huge amount of time on research. Development, yeah. a completely different topic. Sure. <laughs> I, am, I am very driven around product engineering and bringing a service platform to the BSV community. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a good window to maybe talk about the way I think I'm thinking about things, Kurt, in the fact that I don't think transaction fees are the be all and end all for the BSV miners. Uh, I, I almost draw a line around the transaction fee and treat it as the wholesale part of the network. And above the line is the service strategy. And above the line should start to sure. be UTXO services, payment channels, ultimately data storage, mm -hmm. analytics. And, you know, I, I think Tal is on a journey now to take perhaps a little bit of a, the best of an Amazon Web Services experience and an Alchemy in experience and bring them together. Mm -hmm. The launch of our Tal console is the first step and it's in its early stages. But ultimately, I think... You know, I've got three children and two of them are computer science focused and games builders and they don't need complication when they're trying to build and select the technology. They want For to sure. be able to access documents, get to GitHub. They want to be able to build quick, look at sample code. And I think I am strongly motivated to make sure that we are open for business to developers. We need to remove friction yeah. and speed up how cool products and services are being built on BSV. Absolutely. Well, and that's, that's something that... Um always really appealed to me about Tal. Uh, since, since day one, I remember uh, a couple of articles coming out about the transaction processing stuff, but then also the, the sort of extra services, microservices, and, and exactly what you said, uh, basically a platform to allow developers to, oh, cool, I can connect to this and build my app. I don't even need to talk to someone, which is key for a lot of developers. So um, I, I think that's a brilliant start. I got a question from TrustyFly. Uh, Tal... Uh, does Tal provide lookup services or offer the mining yet? I'm not sure I understand the question necessarily. So uh, obviously my colleagues would be would kill me for not mentioning what's on chain. Um, <laughs> uh, so you know what's on chain is just a phenomenal block explorer and search product. It, it really is. Just, just had a uh, you know a, a really cool facelift and some new features and functions put in there, and there is a really strong roadmap for what's on chain this year. So. You know, that's a block explorer, but it's on a journey to ultimately become a search mm -hmm. tool. And, and when you want to start looking at semantic search in the same way you might with Google, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we want to be the leading search engine uh, for what, what is running on the blockchain. For sure. So I don't know if that answers uh, that particular question. Yeah, no, that, that's a, it's a good response anyways. And, and actually a follow-up from me. Um, I know Tal has APIs and what's on chain has APIs and there's seemingly a little bit of crossover and redundancy there. Do you intend for one to take the ball a completely different direction or do you just see them as maybe two different brands that might have two different kinds of customers? Um, I, 
So I, I think we'll, we, we're still discovering that is the honest answer, Kurt, but okay. Watson Chain has got a good following. Um, but uh, at this point in time, I think there is certainly the opportunity where Watson Chain ultimately provides uh, a native kind of broadcast function to send transactions to mm -hmm. the chain, as well as, you know, you get three transactions free on the APIs. And then there's a kind of a trigger that says if you if you want to kind of go further, then that's the point that you're prompted to come over to Tal Console sure. and, and sign up an account to Tal Console. Um, that that's a journey board that a lot of kind of SaaS and PaaS platforms take you through, yeah. and I think that's a good way of uh, you know trying to present services and choice at the market. And from a branding point of view, we will harmonize some of the brands, but equally, I think each of these has a place in, in terms of how. Uh, builders and developers will access uh, the chain really going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So we're a little less than 20 minutes from the end of the show, just in the, in the interest of making sure that you have clarified all the things you want to clarify. Is there anything you like want to really drill into? Is there something that you really wanted to make specifically clear that we can talk on? Um, so obviously we, we, we uh, are here really because I wanted to make sure that there was clarity around now uh, the SV node 1011 release has gone live and it's in our network. And I think for uh, the, the, the colleagues and friends out there that helped me understand what was working and not working, I am really pleased that we have uh, moved away from the relay fee and the dust mm -hmm. fee. I think the other conversation that runs uh, is, yes, there's a journey board to continue to ensure that the BSV network will support big blocks for the long term. Um, and you know, I think we're seeing transactions coming in that are seeing those bigger blocks and uh, on a more regular basis. And mm -hmm. I'm really keen to see more transactions coming in from a diversity of customers. Um, the second thing I think ultimately is, is just to mention that we also have dialogue running around script size. And I think that's the other thing that is coming now from some of the applications that are beginning mm -hmm. to, to push in transactions that warrant slightly larger script sizes. So Again, we, we've put in place a TAL, uh, a free plan that, that gives you up to 10 megabytes. Um, and then you can look at different endpoints to go for larger script sizes. So again, I, I think the tools are in place now to cater for the growth that people have been asking for. What else would I like to say? I think <laughs> that, um, uh, I, I pulled together a technology leaders event a couple of weeks ago. And so I, th I think... You know, I, I would like the audience as they get to know me to know that uh, I like working in a collaborative fashion and uh, Tal does not have all the answers. We only get to build a great company through the help of partners and clients. Yeah, amen. And so we've, we've kind of matured the processes to run, you know, a good portfolio product management process. I will be getting those product managers and analysts and developers out to conferences and making sure we're available to talk to. But you know, we have to do this together. And I'm excited to start seeing, you know, people like Vinext and Sscript um, at the table. I think, you know, when we go from scripting language to mining and everything in between, yeah. this is a system and we have to make sure this system works together. So that, that's the other key message that you're going to see me spend a, a high degree of my time making sure we're paying attention to that architecture and how it's working for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we really need to foment demand. It, it's one of those things where, you know, we, like we do our own R&D over at Gorilla Pool and some of this stuff. And like just this past whatever it was three weeks ago when we had those persistent four gigabyte blocks and, that, you know, what an opportunity on the network. And it's funny to see like, oh, wow, OK, some of our theories were very right and some were very wrong. And you find out they were wrong by, you know, your servers falling over or whatever. And so it's it's interesting that that we get spikes and then less and less infrastructure breaks. I, I remember when stress tests from two or three years ago and we would try to push out 50 megabyte blocks and it would make half the network fall over. And you know, today you, you get persistent four gigabyte blocks and it's certainly some parts of the network do fall over, but it's quite a bit less as a percentage and a, and a lot more people that would have struggled a year ago are Oh wow! Everything everything just worked. It all settled, and and we're building on that block. That's that's fantastic. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's it's great. yeah, it's just it's it's a it's a wow thing for me. I think coming from the sort of theory standpoint, like I really got out of Bitcoin mining in 2015, which obviously there was 
essentially no demand by comparison and uh, but very much became a a theorist at that point about this future big block thing. So the last month or so has been like, you know, a weird uh, like birthday celebration or something for me <laughs> to, to see it yeah. happen. <laughs> We've got a good question here from Jack Pitts. Uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, are the rigs at risk per the cedar risk factors? Uh, so uh, cedar obviously is the uh, regulatory filing platform in Canada. And we as a public company, Put up our public circulars and announced not one that i knew so thank you <laughs> um so yeah uh, obviously we have an obligation to be transparent about risks and material changes in the business at any moment in time so that cedar filing went up a few weeks ago and as i said earlier in in the chat we have a percentage of our mining fleet in siberia and the the disappointing thing about that is it's a fantastic data center and it's 100 percent hydro mm -hmm. um and uh, as I said earlier, and we've put in the, the circulars, yeah, we, we've redirected quite a lot of the machines. And those machines will be in North America going into the second half of this year. And for the fleet size that we have got left there, uh, it's actually part of a managed service. And so uh, we've de-risked that considerably. And it's under week by week review. And what I mean by that is both operationally, but also uh, we have... Uh, uh, outside counsel looking at all of the sanctions and ensuring that Tal does not breach any sanctions in that territory. Yeah, no, it's uh, it is it's a complicated one. <laughs> uh, Carbon Craft asking, are you concerned about the EU ban of proof of work? Will this negatively affect BSV? Uh, you, you sort of touched on how it may, it's a consideration for Tal, but what do you think about BSV as a whole in regards to this sort of uh, increasing criticism of proof of work mining in general? I am concerned about it, Kurt, because I think, uh, you know, that, that EU Parliamentary Council uh, is circa 52 members. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, frankly, I, I think it's a one catch-all opinion of proof of work. And yeah. it is neg negatively biased around what the, the BTC network is doing. Um, so there is no accounting for scale and efficiencies that are coming from larger block sizes and mm -hmm. ultimately the efficiencies that we get in the node. Uh, so yes, this is a, a topic that is on discussion with Bitcoin Association. And I think as we mature as an ecosystem, this places us in the heart of political lobbying. We have to have a voice with these um, parliamentary leaders, with the standards bodies and with the, with the regulators. And so there is effort underway at the moment to make sure that BSV is well understood and the method that BSV uses in its implementation is not banded in with the way that they think about it for, for BTC. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a weird thing to be so connected to the economics of BTC, which is such a, I mean, even just from like a hash power standpoint and the fact that like we need to acquire the same machines, but it's not really our economics that affect the, the price of those machines even. Is there, I don't even know how to get away from that, frankly, but do, do you have any ideas about essentially how to reframe the discussion on on all of that, the consumption and the, the pricing and, and saying, hey, BSV really is a very, like a very different animal, both in the way that it consumes, but the economics of the network, like, I feel like it's so many individual touch points and education silos, basically. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on how we kind of move that ball down a couple of different fields at the same time. Yeah, look, I, you know, I don't think um, proof of work and the BSV implementation, new, new technologies always have their challenges when they come to, to yeah. market. And so this isn't an unusual issue to be facing. Um, I do think we need to put a working group together, and that's what we're talking about, that can sit down in the EU and in the US, and some really great work has already gone on in the US educating Senate and US regulators around uh, the world of BSV and a digital cash system and how that system would work with a central bank digital currency strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the depth of papers that our community has put together is, is just fantastic. Um, and yeah, you're right, Kurt. U ultimately, how do you explain uh, hash throughput? And that whilst that's an economic measure of the ASIC, ultimately now how that is used when you consider how the nodes run and the efficiency mm -hmm. of a node and big blocks, 
you have to look at the stack and the utility of that stack and then look at the unit economics per kilowatt hour. And yep. BSV already is 98% more efficient than BTC. And we need to help those policymakers really understand the methods that make up that efficiency. So quite a bit of work uh, this year, but we, we can't ignore it. We yep. need to do it. No, absolutely. You, you also mentioned lobbying, uh, which is something that I've, I've been saying for years, too, that we really need to make sure that the right people are the ones explaining this to lawmakers and, and other you know, various regulatory groups and things. What do you think lobbying looks like in a Bitcoin economy? I, I think much the same as it's a little bit of a tragedy of the commons. It's like, I don't know, I'm just a big Bitcoin holder. Should I just pay for it myself or, or, or is it some business's job or some organization? What do you think that this should look like? Um, I've seen it when I was in the financial services market. I worked for Deutsche Borsa Group and, you know, a particular division there. We, we had quite a large policy team, uh, which, which were the lobbyists. And that was on electricity, gas and carbon trading markets. And, you know, those are physical products as well as futures contracts. And actually, it was, it was really down to that lobby team and they were largely... Uh, lawyers um, blended with good technical individuals that could actually explain the makeup yeah. of either the technology or the product. And it was the combination of that that had to go in front of parliament, in front of the regulators and the standards and explain. And I think we're in a very similar position. However, <laughs> you can't uh, do this part time. It needs to be a dedicated team. And I, I think, uh, uh, again, this is a discussion across a number of companies within the BSV community at the moment, but I, I think we have to head towards some dedicated resource that long-term is part of the policy and lobby team. Yeah, absolutely. I just put uh, this question up, Alex. Alex normally picks the questions, but uh, we're getting close on time. And I, I think this one is crucial. The next halvening approaches quickly. Do you anticipate a period of time where fees earned fail to compensate for the loss of subsidy? And I think I want to add to this because I, I was talking recently and I had a sort of epiphany that we are extremely behind schedule because from 2009 until 2013, you would get 50 Bitcoins per block. And that's the real first step at replacing the subsidy is to make sure that our blocks have at least 50 coins in them. And none of us have made it anywhere. You know, we're 20% of the way to that goal, frankly, at our, at our best. So I think not even just that, but as the happening approaches, how do, we, how do we make sure we're ready to really start to replace the, the real uh, initial Bitcoin subsidy that, that Satoshi gave us at the beginning? And like, what are your thoughts on this? I, I also think, uh, I'm going to make this too long of a question, frankly, <laughs> but, <laughs> but also I think the, the happening tends to be the bottom of the market or somewhere around the happening tends to be the, the bottom of the price uh, of both coins, but also of like the cost of ASICs and some things too. So how is that factored into what, again, is probably too long of a question now, but I'd love your thoughts. Yeah. So I, I think um, if we run with the way our businesses work today, then I think the risk is very, very high. I, I don't see uh, transaction fees offsetting the loss of subsidy mining by early 2024. And so this places a high degree of urgency in my mind, um, James and Kurt, on this is about the fractionalized Satoshi economy. We have to get payment channels and we have to get UTXO services yeah. and the real utility of the system working and working in the next 12 to 8 months at scale. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the sad thing for the BSV community perhaps is that you know, I think we're probably several years behind where we should be because that potential has been there for a very long time. We've just not got around to getting it in the market properly. Yeah, no, I agree. So I, I think there is absolutely the potential to make up and way exceed the subsidy fees, Kurt, yeah. if, we, if we can ultimately get UTXO services, payment channels. Ultimately, they are the large drivers of high volume transactions into the future. Yeah, absolutely. And we need we need the economy to understand that that if they have a, a payments need or a data integrity need, that the BSV should be on their very short list of 
of opportunities as a, as a technology to make that better. Um, I'm really glad to have you as an ally on, on, on that, Richard. Do you have closing thoughts, sir? Um, closing thoughts, many, uh, but I think um, thoroughly enjoying my journey and my time here, Kurt. Um, and I've got to know uh, quite a few people across the BSV community. I will be in Dubai for the conference, and I really look forward to meeting a lot more people there. Um, I, I would just say, you know, we've we've done some heavy lifting as a company in Q1, um, and we're not in it by ourselves. We're going to make sure that we're working with partners. Um, but I'm really excited about what's ahead. I think there's there's huge potential this year. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it really has been a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad that the, the world gets to see this conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Dubai. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. A pleasure. For sure. Take care. You too. So everybody, that was Richard Baker, the CEO of Tal. Um, I, I am <laughs> a longtime Bitcoiner and longtime hopeful. Uh, I, I have always thought that this technology was capable of changing not just your portfolio. Uh, I've, I've recently started saying that Bitcoin was designed to do more than disrupt your net worth. Uh, it was supposed to disrupt everything from identity, uh, property rights, the ability to facilitate trade that can't be facilitated anywhere else, as well as fixing the money, giving somebody savings that can't just be arbitrarily debased and, and, and plenty of other things. But Bitcoin at scale really is, it's everything. It's, it's what we think of when we think of computation and the internet itself and the ability to engage in commerce across borders and, and really to make the world smaller. And I think one of the benefits of the internet that we've seen is, you know, aside from the vitriol and the, and the politics, that there are very real relationships that could not have happened in the world even a generation ago that happened today and have borne massive fruits for the world. There is real economic opportunity and massive victories. And ultimately, that's what we're here for. The, the BSV economy and, and the people that participate in it are here because they believed that Bitcoin was designed to do more than just make individual lucky people very rich. And it has done that. And many of us benefit from, from that. And, and I think it's time to take that wealth, if you're one of those wealthy people, and really say, hey, can, can Bitcoin make the world exponentially better for that entrepreneur who is landlocked or, or locked in, in a place like Africa, South America, much of East Asia, where they should be capable of conducting business in a way that enriches their lives, but also the lives of their communities and everywhere else. They can do this with Bitcoin, if Bitcoin is BSV. And I know that that's a, a dirty political thought for all kinds of Bitcoiners around the world, but, but it's the goal that, that I'm working for. It's the goal I've been working for really since day one. It's the thing that appealed to me, uh, even in the, the times when, um, <laughs> when, when nobody was talking about it. And even when it was a big conversation in you know, the 2016 and 17 era, the, the Bitcoin civil war, the way I talk about it, but, but really those are the stakes. It is an opportunity to make the world a truly better place in so many ways. So anyways, um, very grateful for Richard's time uh, and also for your time. The, the viewers of this show make this show possible. So I thank you. I ask you to like, subscribe, hit the alert bell so you know every time we go live here on the CoinGeek Weekly live stream. I want to thank Alex Moon for uh, making fun of me for the hour before the show <laughs> because that's what he's best at. Uh, but really, uh, for being such a kick-ass executive producer and uh, being the the head of a lot of things that really matter over at CoinGeek, I'm grateful for his friendship and and for uh, him being a, a a really great colleague. But also everybody up and down the CoinGeek, uh, the hierarchy, the the people I work with are excellent, uh, and I love doing what you're where love doing what I'm doing with with all of these people. We are on this mission together. And uh, I couldn't be more grateful. So, but most of all, I'm thankful to you, the viewers, for making the show possible. <sighs> so I will end with that. Uh, and also say thank you again to my wife and my kids. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you later this afternoon, everybody. So my final thought, every time, <laughs> not every time, but as, as, as often as I can, remember to be good to each other. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. This is a line of code. It is nothing at first.
but it is the start of something. An idea. With the right community, ideas grow into solutions. Welcome to the BSV Global Blockchain Convention. The hybrid BSV Global Blockchain Convention connects the tech and business communities to form partnerships, engage with brands and leaders you care about, shape the next generation of blockchain applications, explore dynamic brand showcases and innovations, discover the positive impact of blockchain on society, regulation and law, cybersecurity, healthcare, environmental sustainability, smart cities, finance, banking, supply chain. The stage is set. Witness the power of blockchain technology. BSV Global Blockchain Convention, where possibilities are boundless.